Okay, so, uh, yeah. but I'm sure you'll be able to correct it. <laughs> okay. Hello, uh, good morning, and uh, uh, good afternoon. So, uh, can you see the share screen now? Uh, I can see the share screen button, yeah. Oh, uh, no, I mean, so I, I see the audience. So uh, today I see a little bit different from the post oh, okay. uh, in my part. Everybody can see the first uh, the share screen? Yep. Okay, good. So uh, uh, once again, welcome you to the World River and Delta Source to Sync webinar series. Today is the, our uh, webinar number 11, 2021 11. So we invite Professor Hans Paul from UNC Chapel Hill, the Institute of Marine Science, come here to talk about North Carolina coastal nutrient and carbon loading and the ecosystem response to those higher rainfall tropical cyclone, particularly like the hurricane landfall at the North Carolina coast. Before I introduce Hans, I want to mention that next week, we also have two talks as always. So next Wednesday, we have Professor Xi Xi from uh, Singapore, University of Singapore, and his student Dong Feng come here talk about the rivering sediment load response to climate change in a high mountain Asia, particularly the Himalaya mountain area with global warming, how the river, how the sediment discharge change to this global warming. That should be a very interesting talk. And also, you are Steen from UK. He will come on Friday, next Friday, come here talk about Amo River. You know, Amo River is a relatively unstudied river. This is the river between the China and the Russia. So how much this river, the Delta, and uh, so the, it should be the evolution, very interesting. So mark your calendar next Wednesday and next Friday. So we also have two source to think uh, talks. And so, for example, like this. So I want to say Hans is the Canadian professor in the UNC, uh, University of North Carolina, Institute of Marine Science. And uh, so uh, Hans is uh, very, very active. A uh, couple of things I want to point out. He has published more than 300 peer-reviewed article. And uh, so uh, with many uh, support, uh, from uh, ASF, EPA, NIH, NOAA, Sea Ground, and uh, so I uh, even our local state, as I mentioned in the beginning, and also uh, has has supervised over seventy graduate students, twelve postdoc, and he received the Evelyn uh, Hutchinson Award, and also the Odem Award from a Coastal and Estuary Research Foundation. And in 2015, he was named the fellow of the AGU. So uh, also uh, the fellow of the Royal Dutch Academy of Science. And most uh, in the last couple of years, Hans is very active, collaborated also with the uh, Ho University and the Nanjing Institute of Geography and uh, Limnology. And uh, I think uh, he's a very, very well uh, known and respected uh, a uh, scholar all over the world. So as I point out, he published more than 300 papers. If you look at his Google citation, he has more than 53,000 citation. Wow, that's really, really something. And based on my knowledge in the source to sync community, in the marine <laughs> science, maybe Hans is the number one, the highest citation as I know. So for example, I know uh, John Millerman and uh, Joyce Whiskey, they only have a 32, 31,000 citation. So Hans, you, you read the bar too high for us. So <laughs> as, as a professor in UNC system, I said, you know, if we, as your standard, no professor should retire if their citation is less than 10, 20 or 10,000. So uh, you, you, did, you just really, really, you know, read the bar too high. So I think I said enough. So uh, now I stop sharing. Hans, please go ahead to share and put a presentation mode. Okay. Uh, let me, uh, how's that? Can you see it? Yes. Okay. I think we're ready to roll. And uh, is there any time left now after that long introduction? <laughs> 
<laughs> no problem. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I feel very, uh, I feel kind of humble. But first of all, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I, uh, I, I'm really looking forward to giving this talk. Um, I was, Paul and I were talking before, and I, I told him and uh, Jay Levine and some others that I really like interdisciplinary research because I'm always learning. You know, as a biologist and an ecologist, uh, I've picked up a lot uh, of interesting data from the physical sciences, geology, uh, even molecular stuff to uh, complement some of the work that I've been sort of traditionally interested in, which is really nutrient cycling, primary production, eutrophication, and the issues that we're facing uh, with those processes. So this talk's going to really be kind of a mix of that, along with what's happening on our coastline. And actually what's happening in our coastline is happening in lots of other coastlines. So it's pretty relevant. Uh, and I, I almost was gonna change my talk to uh, not only tropical cyclones, but extra tropical rainfall events as well, because we are experiencing one right now and have been over the last two to three years. Uh, and I'm looking out the window of my house right now and half the yard is underwater. And that's not just sea level rise, that's uh, just a lot of rain. Okay, so uh, let me start here, go to the next slide, let's see. Uh, there we go, everybody can see that? Yes. Okay, good. good. Okay, good. So I think I'm good the rest of the way. Okay, so I'm gonna focus my talk on the second largest estuarine complex in the US, Pamlico Sound. I think everybody knows where it is, uh, but there are some really important things about Pamlico Sound. It's a huge uh, system. Uh, it, is, it is surrounded by the Outer Banks, and you can see on this remote sensing picture uh, that fragile set of islands, but actually those islands hold in a lot of water, and the water exchange with the coastal ocean is really only confined to three narrow inlets. So the system uh, is actually uh, lagoonal, and it has a long residence time, uh, about a year or so under normal conditions. So what comes into the, into the system stays there for quite a long time and cycles around. And that's what makes it sensitive to uh, being uh, eutrophied or sensitive to eutrophication. You know, one mole, one mole of nitrogen or phosphorus goes a long ways in Pamlico Sound compared to say the, the coastal ocean or even estuaries that have uh, that flush really readily. So it's very susceptible to eutrophication. And as a result, we've had water quality problems and you can see them here with the uh, blooms and fish kills that we've had. I'm gonna switch to the, uh, to the red pen here. Uh, okay, well, there's just a pen there, but you can see the pen. So anyway, um, the other thing that the system uh, is, has been experiencing is a uh, period of increasing frequency of hurricanes. Now, you know, the North Carolina coast has had hurricanes forever, but over the last uh, 25 years or so, there's been a tremendous upswing, not only in the number of hurricanes and tropical cyclones, that so would be anything above a tropical storm, uh, and in terms of the amount of rainfall and the flooding that has been associated with it. And really my talk's gonna focus essentially on that. So we're a hot spot. Uh, no need to remind folks living in North Carolina uh, and it's at a hot moment because things are changing very quickly. And you can see the annual number of days now with precipitation greater than three inches has just skyrocketed over the last decade. And a lot of that is due to uh, hurricanes and tropical cyclones. And you can see the list here from uh, 1996 all the way to uh, pretty, pretty recent. And uh, you know, I always like to say that uh, this slide is not one that you want to show to the local uh, chamber of commerce in Carteret County, because uh, here's where we live, and uh, you can see that a lot of them crisscross right over us, or impact to the west, uh, which would be very, very wet storms or really windy storms to the east. And we've had some recent major cyclones and floods that I'm really going to focus this talk on because they have really been in this sort of new normal period of very excessive rainfall. And I added a line here below 
uh, that actually it isn't just tropical cyclones that are leading to wetter and um, more high rainfall events. We're also experiencing exotropical events and we're having one right now actually. Um, we've had uh, over almost five inches of rain from this recent storm here in, uh, in coastal Carolina. You guys in Raleigh probably haven't had that much, but that, you know, once the pump gets going, and we get that warm air uh, meeting the cold air and moving up the coast, we get a lot of rain and we've been getting more and more rain. All right, so why are we concerned about these cyclones from a uh, sort of a water quality and, and uh, impact on our coastal zone perspective? Obviously there are large hydrologic perturbations, lots of water very quickly leading persistent, to persistent flooding, particularly in low lying areas. And with that comes nutrients, organic matter and contaminants. But also let's not forget about sediments. Uh, the sediments are kind of the slow release fertilizer uh, that comes downstream in that, you know, the sediments uh, don't exit the system very quickly. They settle out and then release nutrients over long periods of time. So we have this sort of quick and dirty nutrient input here from the more soluble forms. And then we have the sediments leading to longer term impacts on the system. That is impacting uh, not only water quality, but habitat. Uh, for example, uh, more hypoxia and anoxia, uh, which can impact food webs and habitability of uh, resources in the system, particularly shellfish and finfish. So there's a lot of reason to be concerned and even more reason to be concerned because we're in this period of elevated hurricane and cyclone activity. Now, North Carolina, this is a long-term record here, North Carolina does go through these cycles and you can kind of see them here, okay? They're like sort of 25 to 40 year cycles of elevated hurricane activity. And that's been known for a long time. But if you look at the most recent upswing in the cycles, you can see uh, the number of storms has gone up. And also with that, the amount of rainfall that we're getting has gone up. Now, one thing we like to uh, work, well, one thing we're really focusing on uh, here on the coast is, you know, to what extent uh, are these climatic impacts overwhelming or even synergistically interacting with human inputs of nutrients and uh, contaminants into our coastal zone? Uh, and this just is kind of a conceptual diagram here showing you the sources of nutrients uh, coming into our coastal systems. Uh, they're cycling leading to excess production, algal blooms, and then the problems associated with that like low oxygen and habitat decline. But overlaid with that is our large storm events, which accelerate the input of these uh, contaminants and nutrients into our coastal zone. So one thing that managers obviously are interested in is you know, to what extent uh, can we do something about this from the human nutrient input perspective? Uh, we obviously can't change the climate in a very short period of time. So we have uh, developed actually for quite a long time now, uh, several monitoring programs which uh, complement the state's monitoring, but this is really a more intensive monitoring effort. Uh, Bi-weekly visits of the Noose River Estuary by ModMon, which has been going on since 1994. And that program collects all sorts of water quality parameters, including uh, nutrients, uh, measuring physical chemical conditions in the estuary, and then the biological components like chlorophyll and uh, 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 bloom dynamics and uh, plankton, uh, looking at the, uh, the plankton dyna dynamics as well. So those are 11 stations going down the noose, vertically profiled. So we get these kinds of vertical profiles in the system. And then we have the ferries and Ferrymont uh, got started in 2000 after Hurricane Floyd uh, essentially flooded the entire eastern part of the state. And we were a, kind of an island out here in Beaufort and Moorhead City for about six weeks because nobody could get to us. But we continued monitoring and that provided a huge service for the state, obviously, uh, to be able to assess what was going on. And I remember very well getting a phone call from the governor's office uh, after they saw this uh, remote sensing picture of Pamlico Sound full of mud uh, asking me, well, Dr. Pearl, what do you know about water quality in Pamlico Sound? And the answer was, uh, it was a very simple answer. We don't know anything because nobody's monitoring Pamlico Sound. So that's how Ferrymont got started. We're equipping 
two ferries that crisscross Pamlico Sound and the noose here at the tracks. Here's the noose. And they're collecting water quality on the fly, so to speak. So instead of vertically profiling, they're horizontally scanning the system uh, with intake at the, at the bow of the ferry, about a meter and a half below the surface of the water. So these traces that you see here are really what's going on on the, on the horizontal scale. And then we've also deployed vertical profilers in uh, conjunction with Rick Ludick's lab, uh, which we can emplace in different parts of the system. And they're intensively monitoring vertical profiles um, every 10 minutes or so in the system. They're, they're solar powered. They essentially have the same uh, sensors on them as uh, Modmon and Ferrymon, the YSI multi-sensors, uh, but it's, it's tethered on a, uh, essentially on a, on a vertical profiling gadget that is uh, sitting at the, uh, that's anchored onto the vertical profiler. So lots of data being collected now. And I just wanted to show you um, what happens when we get a major event, uh, and in this case, Hurricane Florence, which hit us in September of 2018. I think everybody remembers Florence, particularly at the coast. Uh, and what you can see are profiles here from Ferry Mo uh, from Modbon, and these are the pr individual profiles here. And then we use a surfer plot type of uh, data uh, analysis for that. And this is what the uh, Noose River looks like, the Noose River estuary before the storm hit. So this is the fresh water moving down over the salt water that's coming in from Pamlico Sound. And you can see that strong stratification out here. Then after the event, of course, lots of fresh water, basically uh, leading to destratification in most of the estuary. But interestingly enough, Pamlico Sound, unless it's totally flush like it was in with Floyd, does retain uh, strong salinity stratification. So there's the opportunity for hypoxia uh, and low oxygen events to, to happen. But hydrologically, the, the estuaries get overwhelmed uh, over these storm events. Uh, and then um, the other thing I wanted to show you was the, what the nutrients are doing in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus loading uh, from these big events. And so the upper set of graphs here is nitrogen, total nitrogen. And those loads were calculated at New Bern here at the, at the entrance to the estuary. And then the lower one is phosphorus. So these are kind of the bread and butter nutrients that we're interested in with regard to primary production in the system. And what's really evident is in years when we have major storm events and they usually occur you know, later in the year in the fall here, the loads of nitrogen and phosphorus can often be dominated just by single events or in the case of Floyd, Dennis and Irene in 99, uh, they almost totally overwhelm the total uh, nutrient load for the entire year. So these storm events are, they're not only hydrologically really important, but from a nutrient perspective, they can be the dominant source of nutrients. Um, here in the spring, this is what I would call sort of natural nutrient input from the wet spring, uh, wet uh, winter, early spring storm events. So in years where we don't have hurricanes like here in uh, 87 or 97, uh, you can see this is what the normal sort of load would look like. And then uh, of course you get a hurricane year and it's uh, all bets are off in terms of the nutrient budget for the system. So really important source of N and P. And this table basically tells you the percent increase over baseline due to storms that we see. And I've just circled TN and TP just to uh, emphasize how important they are. Now those nutrients are translated into primary production and we know that the new estuary and Pamlico Sound and most of the coastal systems are very sensitive to nutrients, particularly nitrogen. So what I wanted to show you is what chlorophyll looks like in the noose uh, in relation to these storm events. And you can see from uh, four major events that we had, there are spikes in chlorophyll afterwards, uh, but there are also spikes that are not associated with tropical storm events. And those are the events like what we're having now. Basically, uh, you know, extra tropical events. Anytime we have a big discharge event, we see a pretty strong response in primary production in the system because these systems are nutrient limited. They are nutrient sensitive, particularly to nitrogen. And this is just a long term data set for ModMon, just to show you the sort of linkage of chlorophyll responses that we see. So here's chlorophyll as an indicator of algae 
the algal biomass. And you can see that when we have wet storm events like Ernesto, uh, Dennis Floyd and Irene, for example, and then we had uh, Joaquin, which was actually an offshore storm, but delivered a tremendous amount of rain, uh, we see the, the, the strong chlorophyll responses in the system. And the responses are not instantaneous because initially, you know, there's a lot of flushing going on. So the algae don't really have enough time to really build up biomass. So it takes a while for the uh, algal blooms to respond in, in the system. Uh, and you can see that here with Floyd and uh, Dennis Floyd and Irene, where the blooms didn't occur until the next spring or so, well into the summer. So there is a response, sometimes quickly, if there's not that much discharge, uh, but most of the time there's a little bit of a delayed response so the algae can catch up with the residence time increasing in the system. Okay, I just wanna focus very quickly on what happened in 1999 because that was a year when um, I was just about ready to quit and pack up and go back to California. We had three uh, category three hurricanes all within six weeks. Um, it basically drove us crazy and it was a really uh, terrible set of events that occurred here on the coast. But these events uh, led to record rainfalls uh, in Pamlico Sound, we had 12 inch rainfall totals uh, that exceeded 100 year uh, storm, uh, rainfall events. And then from the discharge perspective, we had fi uh, 50 to 500 year floods in the watershed, uh, from, uh, mainly from Floyd. And Pamlico Sound itself uh, received its annual load in one and a half months. So this gets back to that graph, you know, where you can see the, the loads here. Um, here, here you see the nitrogen load, for example. That all that essentially was the annual load within one and a half months. So you know, really huge uh, impacts. Um, the other thing I need to point out is that Pamlico Sound uh, does have a fairly long residence time, but even after these hurricanes, the residence time is reduced to a few months instead of a year or so. So it's sort of like a giant bathtub overflowing. Uh, you know, when you fill it up too much. And, and that's sort of what this remote sensing picture shows you. Here's the uh, pre-hurricane. Uh, this is a CWIFS picture, by the way. CWIFS is no longer up, but uh, it's been replaced by MODIS and some other uh, good platforms. But we took advantage of uh, CWIFS imagery and here's the imagery beforehand. And then here uh, about uh, a week to a week and a half after Floyd's flood water started to come down the major tributaries. And you can see that humicky dark water making its way down here in Albemarle Sound and then flowing into Pamlico and then through the uh, Southern rivers. And what's neat about this picture is you can see the overflow phenomena going on here from Pamlico Sound and the sediment and humic laden waters being advected out by the Gulf Stream out into open ocean water. So a uh, huge event um, and here is some of the uh, responses that we saw in the system. This is salinity at this station X, which uh, actually was a station that was developed by Joe Ramos with his students when they went out for classes. And so we had prior data from that uh, data set for Pamlico Sound for the open sound. And you can see the salinity normally varies between around 15 to 20 uh, PSU. Then we had the three major storm events which essentially freshened up the system. And you can see the salinity dropping down to near zero and it took almost a year for the salinity to get back up to normal. So that matches the residence time, uh, uh, you know, measurements that have been made for the system really well. Here's the biological response. So this is chlorophyll A and you can see the slight delay here, but then the bloom started up. And actually there were several sets of blooms. <clears throat> Remember I, mentioned to you the sediment input leading to you know, slow release uh, later on. So we had elevated uh, bloom activity in the system well for, all, for almost a year after the storm impacted the, uh, the, the Pamlico Sound. So the responses are not necessarily instantaneous and they're usually pretty long lived. The other thing I should mention is that with all that fresh water uh, coming into Pamlico Sound, it essentially overlaid some of the salt water that was still left in the system 
which led to very strong salinity stratification and essentially an anoxic zone in the bottom part of the western part of Pamlico Sound. It's the first time we ever have seen that, but of course the monitoring programs uh, only got started uh, during, during that event as well. Uh, so big events, big responses. The other thing that I'd like to point out is that the responses are not always going on in the same place in terms of uh, phytoplankton or algal growth responses. And this is a series of Sea West picture that Larry Harding, uh, who was collaborating with us, uh, uh, worked, oops, going the wrong way here, worked on in, uh, oh, back in the two, early 2000s when he flew an aircraft with the uh, Sea West sensor on board. And what we're looking at are different sort of hydrologic periods. So here's a low flow period uh, early in the year in May. And you can see the chlorophyll is largely concentrated in the upper parts of the estuary. And that's because the phytoplankton can intercept the nutrients and residence time is long. So, you know, they're growing up in the upstream part of the estuaries. Then as the flow increases, more nutrients are entering the system and you're getting a bigger response, but also things are moving out into Pamlico Sound. And this is Albemarle Sound, by the way, discharging into uh, Pamlico Sound as well. And then under high flow events, this was a tropical depression, I believe, in July of 2002, you can see the estuaries now are acting as pipelines. The residents, they're, 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 the nutrient loads are high, but the residence time is also quite short because of the high flow. And so the response is out here in the sound. And then we go back into a low flow period, which looks a lot like this. So really important to monitor in space and time correctly in order to really capture the overall uh, response to these events. We've also been working in some other estuaries in North Carolina. This is the New River Estuary. It's part of a project that we had uh, uh, with the Marines, uh, the Camp Lejeune base, which bisects the uh, New River Estuary here. And we had a vertical profiler in place, uh, courtesy of Rick Ludick and his crew, which was measuring temperature, salinity, uh, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, and turbidity. And we had the good fortune, or some might say the bad fortune, of actually having a tropical uh, cyclone event that came over us, uh, Tropical Storm Hannah. And I just wanna show you what the data looked like because we kept the sensors in there during that event. Um, it's kind of an interesting side story there. I had to convince Rick and his technicians to leave the, the vertical profiler in. <laughs> they wanted to take it out to, because of the storm. And I said, well, you know, we'll cover it if you lose it. Fortunately, we didn't lose it and they corrected some great data. So here you can see temperature homogeneous, salinity homogeneous, oxygen homogeneous, everything is mixed in the system as a storm event comes over. But what I want, want to take you is down here with the chlorophyll and turbidity data. And what you can see is that there was a bloom in the system and you can see it migrates between the surface and the bottom, pretty cool. Uh, but also pretty much surface blooms. Then the storm came along, mixed everything up. Then of course it mixed all the chlorophyll up, but look at what happened afterwards. The bloom came right back and it came back even with a greater biomass than it did before the bloom, uh, before the storm. And here's the turbidity. This is largely sediment resuspension in the system. And of course the sediments will have nutrients associated with them. So you're getting nutrient uh, injection essentially from the sediments back into the water column. And we think that's one of the reasons why the blooms actually were greater afterwards than before. Now also, of course, there's runoff coming into the system adding nutrients as well. And that probably plays a factor later on with the bloom. So very dynamic. These bloom organisms don't get wiped out by a storm. In fact, they have sort of learned to take advantage of it. And I wanna take you one slide to China uh, for Paul and others. Uh, this is Taihu, Lake Taihu, the lake that I've been working on for over a decade, uh, which has very serious eutrophication problems. And this is a modus uh, imagery of uh, chlorophyll in the lake. And Taihu, or the coastline in China, is pretty much the same latitude as we have here in North Carolina. It's like in the low 30s. And so they also get these storms that come up from the Pacific 
and make landfall uh, reasonably close by to Shanghai, which is really close to Taihu. And we had, again, the good fortune of running into typhoons and seeing what happened afterwards. And we also had a year where we didn't have any typhoons. And what I want to show you is the, the, here we, the typhoons, they generally tend to hit in August. Okay, and look at what happens with chlorophyll afterwards. So the bloom initially was all mixed up or mixed into the system, and then it came back with an even bigger biomass than before. And then when there is no mi major mixing events, the bloom essentially dissipated uh, due to nutrient limitation. And then here we have other years with hurricanes or typhoons that led to this resuspension thing. So I think what we're seeing in lakes is somewhat similar to what we're seeing in estuaries with these systems, uh, the big mixing events, and then of course, followed by discharge of nutrients. This is data from going back to the noose uh, from uh, tropical storm Ernesto. And while it was a tropical storm, it also was a very wet storm. I think we had something like six to 10 inches of rain from Ernesto, which led to this uh, salinity stratification in the noose. And you can see the fresh water here coming down, overlaying the salt water coming in from Pamlico Sound. That created a very strong salinity gradient. And al also the residence time, of course, increases going downstream into the system. And that allowed a bloom to start up right here at that, at that gradient, essentially, in the system. So this is dissolved oxygen, or this is uh, chlorophyll and dissolved oxygen. So the bloom was able to take advantage of the nutrients coming in with that flow. And then as the residence time increased, it allowed for enough time to, uh, to, uh, for the growth rates of the phytoplankton to catch up with flushing rates. And as a result, we got a bloom in a very well-defined part of the estuary right in here. And this is the data, the, the cell abundance data at station 60, which is up in here, uh, right up in here. And then this is the toxin production. Turned out that this was a toxic dinoflagellate bloom that took advantage of the, uh, of the storm. Uh, and we had our colleagues at the NOAA lab uh, determine the toxicity and also did some of the identification of the cells for us. So here's you know, a sort of advantageous uh, event, a bloom taking advantage essentially, or bloom organisms taking advantage of this discharge event, high nutrients, but not high enough in flow to totally flush out the system. And that allowed this bloom under favorable light and temperature conditions to really uh, get going. Um, this data ended up being really valuable for the state because it also led to fish kills later on in the estuary. And of course, the fish kills have been a subject of a lot of mystery and uh, different interpretations of what's killing the fish. But in this case, we were able to show the state that there was a toxic dinoflagellate bloom, carlidinium, that uh, essentially led to kills on both sides of the estuary here that followed about a week later. So uh, good monitoring leads to good management. Okay, now I wanna finish up with uh, carbon uh, because I know everyone's interested in carbon and actually having worked with Chris, my interest in carbon has increased tremendously. Um, and so I'm going to look at carbon flux and how that's impacted by these storm events in, the, uh, in, in our coastal zone. And this is a picture basically of the uh, humic plumes coming uh, after, uh, I think this was probably after um, uh, Florence. Uh, and this basically is a diagram that Chris Osborne put together showing what happens to carbon flux after these storm events. And of course, with higher river flux, we're getting a lot of delivery of organic matter. Uh, that's supporting uh, components of the food web, but it's also increasing respiration of that organic matter and CO2 release from the estuary itself. And I'm going to cover some of this stuff over the next uh, few slides just to give you some idea of how big those impacts are. So, you know, the sources of carbon, sedimentary rocks, soil streams, riparian sources, transported through the rivers, over the floodplains, into our estuaries. Uh, and also um, discharge from wetlands associated with uh, the, uh, the coastal plain, of course, and then out in the coastal ocean. And two things that uh, Chris emphasized here is that the CO2 is the terminal product, of course, of the degradation. And uh, DOC 
you know, there's a qualitative aspect to this. Not all DOC is the same. Some of it is more recalcitrant than other forms of uh, DOC. And we'll cover that a little bit. So I had a student, Joey Croswell, back in the early, two, well, in the, around 2010 or so, in the, uh, got his PhD. Joey was really interested in PCO2 and flux of carbon dioxide uh, in and out of our estuaries. And so he built this gadget to measure uh, CO2 flux that we put on our ModMon vessel. Uh, and, and that would then give us some idea of the air water CO2 flux going on under different uh, hydrologic and weather conditions. And we were, had, again, the good fortune of being able to deploy this during uh, various storm events. And what, you, what this plot is all about is essentially CO2 flux uh, when it's either going into the system, so that would be going down or out of the system. So zero would be a net flux of zero, essentially. And in years where we don't have major perturbations, of course, there's a greater influx of CO2 due to primary production in the system. But when we have the storm events, we get a lot of efflux of CO2. And uh, you can see here during you know, various storm events, there's a lot of CO2 being vented from the system back up into the air. And this is, this is Noose River data. And we also went to the New River and found as a PowerPoint, I saw that one. I'm trying to get out of the email, but it won't let me get out. Okay, here we okay, go. Okay, here, yeah. And you okay. can share. Yeah. Okay, hang on. Yeah, right. yeah, you're back online now. All right, thank you. Thanks for being patient. So, uh, okay, so here's where we were, right? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so anyway, one, I, I guess, that statement of Joey Croswell's must have been quite a statement. It knocked me off the air. But anyway, uh, in his statement, he basically says, you know, that it that one tropical cyclone can liberate as much CO2 as was fixed by the phytoplankton during a year. So these are really big events in terms of CO2 flux that's going on in the system. And if we look at carbon, um, we can see that, you know, the carbon, uh, discharge that's going on. This is the DOC load, uh, again, through the ModMon data, uh, is huge with these events. It's just like the nitrogen and phosphorus, basically. Uh, and you can see that the DOC and POC, uh, in terms of percent increase over the baseline, is huge with these events as well. OK, so now, OK, so if we look at what's going on with uh, these major events. This is Matthew, uh, which was another 500 year storm event that occurred in 2016. And somebody's going to have to explain to me how you can have three 500 year events in 20 years, but that, that's probably for another, for another discussion. Uh, but we've had those kinds of events in 20 years, basically. This is what the discharge looks like in the news. This is what the, uh, I'm trying to get, get rid of this thing over here, uh, let me move this down. Okay, this is what chlorophyll A looks like up in the upper part, and then here's DOC. So you see, you, oops, you see the, uh, you see that the event occurring, it's flushing the phytoplankton out of the system, putting DOC in the system uh, and increasing the load tremendously. And then you can see the phytoplankton do come back after that lag time in the system as well. So, you know, it's, it's a highly dynamic situation, but the bottom line is that we're getting a lot of enrichment of both nutrients and DOC uh, in the system at the same time. So, you know, the, the carbon flux is strongly impacted by these storm events. And why is that important? Um, I'm gonna try to move this bar down here. How do I get rid of, uh, I'm trying to get rid of the, uh, I can't see the bottom of my slides right now because there's a, uh, ah, okay, good. Uh, the organic matter, you know, the dissolved organic matter is obviously consumed by heterotrophs, at least what's, what's consumable of that. That supports the microbial loop and contributes to the change in alkalinity and acidity, but also the CO2, of course, flux that goes back up because there is CO2 being 
produced from the degradation by organic matter. And then I, I won't cover the other things here, but uh, we'll just, let's see. Okay. So here we're looking back at uh, Hurricane Florence. This is recent data. Again, the big flush from Florence in the system. And then this is data from Ryan uh, up your way uh, on respiration rates that are going on in response to these storm events. So the, the lighter this gets uh, in this graph, the higher the respiration rate. So it's obvious that some of that organic matter that's being flushed down is being respired. It is biologically available. And um, fortunately, you know, he got started before the storm. So you can see the baseline uh, on the data that was collected on respiration beforehand and then afterwards. And his work is continuing um, with our Maibon runs. Um, we're providing samples for him to look at the longer term effect in, uh, of temperature, organic matter, et cetera, on the respiration rates. But you can clearly see that there's a big response in respiration rates uh, from these storm events. So the other thing I wanna point out with regard to organic matter loading, and this is really work that Chris and his students have been doing, is that the floodwaters, you know, when, when you get flooding, of course, you increase the connectivity between wetlands and the main stem of the rivers. And the organic matter in the wetlands is, is then gonna be flushed downstream where it can be further processed and exported to the coastal zone. Uh, wetlands can contribute a lot of the DOC to rivers. And of course, when they're flushed, like what we're seeing, that increases even more. So there is this issue with uh, you know, wetlands contributing to organic matter, you know, normally they store a lot of carbon, but then when you get the big flush, you get this export of CDOM rich water to our uh, coastal zone. And Chris has done some really nice work with his students on looking at the uh, carbon uh, 13 signal uh, into Pamlico Sound, which really uh, shows that uh, both the estuarine and sound samples are bounded by freshwater uh, wetlands and, and river inputs. And the sounds, the values that he's getting in the sounds uh, seem to be a mixture of ocean water input and then of course the wetland discharge to the sound. So what's interesting is that some of that of course is biodegradable but also some of that carbon is going to be residing and sitting in the sound uh, for quite a long time and again act as a slower release source of uh, organics and CO2 and nutrients that are associated with it. So the sound is really kind of a long-term sort of incubator uh, for this uh, organic matter that's discharged. And uh, Chris's work is looking at actually trying to compartmentalize the sources of organic nitrogen. Uh, of course, we're interested in nitrogen because it's the limiting nutrient, uh, but he's using fluorescent techniques to sort of distinguish the different sources uh, of that organic matter coming into the system. And you can see the different ones that uh, have been uh, looked at uh, using this technique called, called uh, Eam Parafac, which is separates the organic matter classes by, uh, by their, by their uh, signature, essentially, uh, the excitation versus emission signature of these uh, organic compounds. So, you know, we're looking at this qualitatively and also quantitatively to see how important uh, those sources are and which sources are actually used um, as they travel through the estuary into the uh, coastal zone. Now, from our perspective, what we're interested in is, you know, do the algae use some of this organic matter that's being flushed down with hurricanes? And uh, I just wanted to show you some data from the New River, which we did quite some time ago. Uh, but it's pretty interesting in the sense that uh, if you look at a bioassay where we add the different uh, uh, sources from floodwaters or from discharge, and then look at the growth response of the algae. In this case, we were using Noose River water and that was then incubated uh, in back of IMS at the, uh, in the ponds. You can see that inorganic nitrogen stimulates relative to the control, no effect of phosphorus, effective uh, uh, DIN and phosphorus, but no more than just DIN alone. So it's clearly nitrogen limited. But then if we look at a DON source, in, uh, and this is natural DON from river water coming in, you can see that there's pretty profound stimulation. And it's interesting, in this case, the dinoflagellates were stimulated, uh, the cyanobacteria were not. Uh, 
And uh, actually the cyanobacteria were stimulated by phosphorus probably because they were fixing nitrogen. But the bottom line here is that organic nitrogen can be bioreactive. So I think uh, this needs to be included in terms of the nutrient load that's going on uh, supporting eutrophication and it ultimately algal blooms. So just to kind of summarize the carbon part of it, uh, this is data, this is a, a graph made by Joey uh, Croswell again. Here's the before storm scenario. So here's the river input coming into the estuary. Uh, the phytoplankton are doing well in the upper part of the estuary. They're intercepting nutrients. Uh, so largely CO2 flux uh, where the blooms are occurring is inward. Uh, and then the storm comes along. And then of course you're getting all this organic matter loaded or organic matter rich water coming into the estuary. That is lead, enhancing respiration, uh, leading to net CO2 release from the system. Also some of that CO2 is just being released due to turbulence and, turb and resuspension and stuff like that. Uh, the weather's poor, so you're not getting much photosynthesis uh, and the algae are being flushed out of the system. So this is gonna be a efflux situation with CO2. And then later on, after the system settles down, you're still getting residual stormwater runoff, which is leading to high respiration, but the phytoplankton are coming back and enhancing the influx of CO2. Uh, so the net effect would be less going back up in the uh, atmosphere. So more intense hurricanes have led to uh, big biomass losses in terms of carbon coming into our coastal zones. Uh, and that some of that mobilized carbon is accumulating wetlands over decades and centuries and then gets flushed into the system. So the, the interesting thing here from a kind of a physical, chemical, biological perspective is that we sort of have a worrisome feedback going on. We're getting more intense storms. They're leading to more carbon mobilization, more CO2 being released into the atmosphere from that carbon that's coming into our uh, coastal waters. And is that leading to more intense storms? Because see, this is part of the CO2, of course, that's going to be uh, enhancing the greenhouse effect. So, you know, you can sort of see this, see this evil spiral here uh, and where it stops, nobody knows. Uh, but there could be very much a linkage here in terms of terrestrial carbon coming into the coastal zone, leading to more CO2 release, which would then affect our climate uh, through more intense storms. Okay, the last thing I wanna point out is uh, really kind of the worrisome thing here for us living in a coastal zone. And that is that if you look at the data, uh, and this is data from a paper we published in sci uh, scientific reports back in 2019, uh, you can see that uh, the storm frequency that we're seeing in our coastal zone has not increased all that much, although there, are, there is evidence that it has increased more recently in the last 20 to 30 years. Really what's really important is the precipitation. And you can see that the, in, in, the, in the last several years, uh, certainly in the uh, 90s and onward, we've had very wet storm events. The bottom line is that six out of seven of the wettest storm events over this uh, 120 year data set have occurred in the last 20 years. So clearly it's getting rainier and wetter with tropical cyclones. And now I'm starting to wonder whether that's also true for extra, tropical systems like we're experiencing right now. Um, and I'm looking out the window here in the yard, which is just totally flooded now um, from more rain that's falling. This is leading to increased uh, pulse and press disturbances with these major uh, storms and floods that are coming into our coastal zone, leading to more eutrophication, hypoxia, and then of course accompanied by increases in temperature uh, and for sure up in the upper part of estuaries, more acidification, and then put that together with sea level rise. Uh, we see we've got a problem here in terms of uh, water in the coastal zone. And it's all connected. Um, this, is a, this is a conceptual diagram that Joey and I put together for a, a short review for estuaries and coasts. Uh, here's the carbon connection back to, uh, of course, uh, eutrophication with uh, nutrients coming in, uh, leading to more intense uh, um, blooms, uh, 
you know, the climate essentially is really connected to water quality in, a, in, in multiple ways. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, the part we really, the manageable part of this obviously is this part right in here how much nutrients and carbon are we going to be able to manage and control in the watershed to minimize these impacts that are uh, supporting eutrophication and then the uh, feedback cycle that's going on with carbon. Uh, very last thing, uh, this is for the physical folks and geologists. Um, we're not only having biogeochemical and physical perturbations, but also, uh, I'm sorry, biochemical and biological perturbations, but also physical ones. And this is the inlets that Isabel created back in, uh, I think it was 2011 uh, or 2003, I'm sorry, uh, with a new inlet that was cut as the storm moved its way across the Pamlico Sound uh, up north. Uh, that led to uh, a much higher connectivity of the coastal waters with our estuarine waters. And using the Ferrymon data, we were able to show how salinity was affected by the inlet that was formed from Isabel. So here's the pre-Isabel data. And this is the salinity gradient from east to west in the Pamlico Sound along the ferry route. And you can see it was dropping. And that was because we had a wet summer uh, with freshening of the sound going on. Then the hurricane cut the new inlet. Salt water moved into the Pamlico Sound. And it wasn't until uh, DOT came along and filled up that inlet, and it actually took quite a long time before we got back to our original pattern in the uh, sound itself. So there are these huge perturbations in terms of salinity and obviously impacts on habitat uh, and water quality along with that. So the big picture long-term concern is all about ecosystem resiliency and stability in response to this new normal. You know, we know we have this increase in frequency uh, and accompanied by higher rainfall and more extremeness. And so the question for sort of us ecologists is what's the multiple sort of multi-annual ecological effects that are going on? And the really worrisome thing with a higher frequency and more extreme events is that as we get in terms of ecosystem response and uh, you can sort of also name this really resiliency, so we have hurricane one here, first one. And then as that hurricane, uh, as the impacts of that hurricane are being uh, processed and the system is responding to it, we may be impacted by another hurricane, which would then again, bring us back to uh, the starting point in terms of uh, sort of recharging the system and so forth. So we think we're in this sort of period of instability in our coastal waters certainly from an ecological perspective, but also biogeochemically, as we're being more impacted by a higher frequency uh, with more discharge of nutrients, carbon and contaminants in the system. Uh, and this is really, you know, should be a major concern to a, a big fisheries resource, resource and habitat like Pamlico Sound, obviously. All right, so last slide, what can we do about all this? Uh, well, first of all, Here's what we think is happening. The storm-driven nitrogen and phosphorus loading is increasing in our coastal waters. That's promoting more eutrophication and ultimately algal blooms and declines associated with that. Uh, organic matter has also increased, altering the carbon flux, uh, particularly CO2 flux, promoting eutrophication, hypoxia, and altering the uh, planktonic and benthic habitats. This is all being impacted by the new normal with increased frequency, more rainfall, flooding, and then combining that with uh, ocean warming and sea level rise, you can see how this has sort of become a, a kind of an evil, evil feedback spiral. What can we do about it? Well, the obvious thing is to reduce greenhouse gases to the extent that we can, because that's really the long-term underlying issue that's really promoting this. Uh, and then in terms of you know shorter term plans, uh, having more sustainable um, responses, minimizing nutrient inputs and organic inputs in the watershed through things like constructed buffers, wetlands, retention impoundments is critically important to the extent that we can do that. And the other big need, and uh, I wanna stress this because you know, monitoring is really um, in trouble because 
you know, it, it's not a sexy part of science in most cases. And uh, given all the issues that we're facing right now with COVID and other expenditures, uh, the monitoring programs that we're engaged in, including Mobmon and Ferrymon, are really on the, um, are, are hurting from a lack of funding. Uh, what we need to do is, you know, take as much advantage as we can of remote sensing to be able to scale up some of our water quality monitoring capabilities to uh, larger scales and bigger systems. Um, and then of course, combining that with adaptive nutrient and carbon management in response to these events. Uh, and without good monitoring, I think we're not gonna be able to say to what extent we need to do any of these steps uh, to try to uh, maintain some sort of sense of stability and resiliency in our coastal waters particularly if you look at the other pressures that are going on like fishing, recreational use, um, development, et cetera. So I'll stop there and uh, just thank uh, some of the funding uh, sources that have funded a lot of this stuff over the last 20, 30 years uh, and uh, leave the, uh, what time we have left for any questions. Thank you very much. Oh, Hans, thank you. Thank you so much for this fantastic talk. You know, uh, this, this is just a very, very cool. You know, uh, in a real source to think community, try to quantitatively define the global uh, river, the, the discharge sediment, the flux part, the nutrient, the, the carbon. It's yeah. a big challenge. I, yeah. I, I, and also the even more challenge is the event driving. How much of those flux because of the event, like a big storm, typhoon or hurricane. So you are so lucky. Many people only able to catch up one or two event in their yeah. research, but yeah. you kind of have a six or seven uh, hurricane event I see on the 25 years uh, consistent uh, long-term observation. That's amazing. That's really, really cool. So I need to go back to rewatch your presentation once again. But anyway, so let's to the audience. If you have any question, as always, you can unmute yourself. Go ahead and just ask. I see Bob Allen already raised the hand. Bob, you can unmute yourself. You just go ahead to ask. For yeah, those Bob. on our YouTube channel, if you have any question, you can uh, type the questions there. I will read it for you, or you can come here in the Zoom. Okay. So Bob, go ahead. Hi, yeah. Bob. Hi, Hans. That, thanks a lot. That was really great. A tremendous uh, integration of uh, the monitoring and long-term observations you've made. Um, I'm wondering, you, you didn't mention it, and I don't know very much about Pamlico Sound, but um, are there major inputs uh, from uh, submarine groundwater flow associated with these uh, events? Yeah, there, there have been studies uh, largely by the USGS. And I think some of the folks at ECU have also done, uh, looked at the input, the uh, recharge that we're getting from groundwater. And after, I know that after the um, three major hurricanes we had in 99, there was groundwater recharge going on for quite a long time, uh, close to a year or so. So it is important. Um, I don't think we really have good numbers in terms of how to compare that to surface runoff in terms of the overall load, but it certainly should be counted, I think, in, the, uh, in terms of the long-term uh, impacts that we're seeing on these systems. Now, in some places like the Noose uh, watershed, for example, um, uh, some of the groundwater resurfaces before, you know, you actually get to the estuary. So, um, because it's so low lying and the aquifer is pretty shallow. Mm -hmm. So again, that needs to be factored in as well. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Okay. Next, Dave. Thanks Hans. That was, that was great to see all that, uh, put together and great fun to see, uh, uh, how the, <laughs> climate is affecting or impacting the uh, estuarine system. So, uh, yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, it's fun now, but it isn't fun when it's actually happening. Oh yeah, for <laughs> sure. But it's intellectually uh, enjoyable to see how all these variables yeah. come together in a, you know, a complex and dynamic system. 
Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, with regard to the source, you, obvious the uh, biologically available nitrogen uh, is stimulating chlorophyll. I'm wondering if you can pull apart the resuspension in uh, the uh, uh, sounds, resuspension of sediment in the sounds, which might be more ammonia dominated, ammonium dominated, yeah. uh, as compared to the riverine input of bioavailable nitrogen, uh, which may have a little higher nitrate uh, and yeah. might even be isotopically identifiable as compared to the uh, uh, resuspension. I'm wondering if you pull them apart as to the main source of the bioavailable nitrogen. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting, um, quite great question. Um, and we know that ammonium, for example, is, is uh, preferred often by uh, algae, particularly if they're light limited in terms of uh, supporting growth. So that's another issue is, uh, you know, the time scale of uptake and how that ultimately translates into biomass. Um, you know, really good monitoring can help us with this too. Uh, and if you go back to that uh, slide that I showed you on the New River, um, you know, I think that what was going on there, uh, this was the, you know, multi-graph slide, you know, when the hurricane, uh, you know, with the vertical profilers, I think what we're seeing there is a rapid response to resuspension, which is probably ammonium mainly right. coming back up in the water column. And then if you look at it later on, you're seeing a sort of a secondary uh, response and that is likely more related to runoff, you know, and stuff coming in from the rivers. So there's a time scale uh, difference there too. How long does ammonium last in the water column? What are not, nitrification not, rates? Is it a matter of days or? Yep, um, it's very quick, particularly okay. in the summertime. The system is screaming for nitrogen all the time. So, you know, if you're getting a resuspension event, the ammonium that's associated with that is really quickly mopped up um, and then regenerated. So, you know, and, and uh, Early studies by Bob Christian and uh, Don Stanley in the news using N15 showed that uh, the system, you know, when you're not getting any big in inflows like what I've shown you, is when the system is really chronically nitrogen deficient, uh, about 90% of the primary production is supported by regenerated nitrogen. So that ammonium right. is just, it's just cycling around really fast. Yeah, I'm just wondering that during a storm, if the denitrification or the nitrification rates are uh, uh, are similar to what they are during non-storm times, I, if the resuspension mm -hmm. and the low oxygens uh, uh, extend the time that the ammonium uh, is uh, avoiding being nitrified, uh, yeah. they, if you might have a longer residence time of that ammonium relative to nitrification, you probably have a shorter one with regard to uh, primary productivity uptake, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. it could be longer. You could have longer nitrification times or rates uh, yeah. with well, uh, a, a resuspension event and low oxygen. Yeah, no, that's right. Our, I think in general, our impression is that the phytoplankton are really good at mopping up ammonium when it's there. So they probably get the jump on nitrification, at least in the short term. Okay. I'd be interested in the idea of, uh, that you brought up towards the latter part of your presentation about uh, carbon dioxide and its relationship, uh, how much of a source is actually from the ocean and how much of it is uptake and is there some kind of a, a good reference to that study? Uh, something that uh, would give it to us both um, associated with these kind of events you were talking about, but also, um, you know, on a, on a mean or global basis, are we getting an increase, significant increase source into the atmosphere? from the ocean? From the ocean. Um, I think, well, 
or from or from the waterways like you talked about. I think I think really the watershed is really the key here. The brownification that's going on, the uh, loss of carbon that we're experiencing from watersheds that's going into our estuarine and coastal systems is clearly uh, becoming a larger source of carbon that can then be mineralized to CO2. Um, and what I was getting at, which is purely speculation, is that, you know, if that's increasing, then really what we're seeing is the cycle is sort of, you know, t uh, spinning faster, so to speak. You know, the, we're getting more CO2 being released back up into the atmosphere. And if that's having any significant impact in the terms of the total CO2 budget that we're seeing uh, in terms of increase, well, then, you know, we're getting a positive feedback there in terms of uh, more intensive storms because that's leading to warming, uh, bigger, uh, wetter storms, more erosion out of the watersheds, more organic matter. And yeah, and this is really way out of my wheelhouse, but you know, yeah. um, as a biologist, I can always speculate on stuff like that. <laughs> do, you, do you know of any good reference on uh, the just that uh, CO2 balance? Yeah, I think uh, what I can do is get you in, actually, I'll send you Joey Croswell's papers. First of all, he had, had a very nice paper out on this in LNO uh, back in 2014. And then I can get you in touch with Joey. He's in Australia, but you know, he's, he's very, uh, he, he's a great communicator. So um, send me an email and I'll uh, be glad to, to make the connection. Thank you. Hey, Wanta. Yeah, go ahead, Wanta. Yeah, uh, great talk, Hans. Uh, I actually had a question about the, I guess it's orange arrow on your schematic here. And that is the pollutants that are mobilized either uh, when you flood agricultural fields and mobilize uh, pesticides or you flood uh, uh, urban areas that are streamed along rivers and there's warehouses and factories and stuff. Are you seeing these toxins in, in your system or are they having an impact from these? Well, emissions? We don't really we don't really assess toxins, so you know we're uh, we're my guess would be is that there certainly is more uh, loss of these. Sub You're talking about things like agricultural chemicals and um, mm -hmm. industrial chemicals, and you know if you're flooding a city, a town like say Kinston or Goldsboro, I mean I've actually seen pictures of giant oil slicks, you know, uh, going back into the Neuse River. Uh, from uh, leaky tanks and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, I think the I think there certainly are more contaminants being discharged with along with these storm events, but I really don't have any direct data on that. Thanks. Okay. So, Hans, I have two two uh, quick questions. You mentioned about somebody tested the PCO two. So, how about uh, first? Uh, how about the acidification? Did you see any pH pH value variation after before and after storm? Yeah, and yeah. Well, interesting. Interesting. You should ask that question because we're actually working on a paper with our colleagues in Chesapeake Bay on the whole issue of estuarine acidification. And oh. as you can, as you can imagine, it is much more complex than open ocean acidification. Sure. Because what we're dealing with is we're dealing with eutrophication, which is sucking up more CO2. And then we're dealing with, you know, discharge of organic matter, which would be releasing more CO2 into the water. And what we're seeing, I can just tell you what we're seeing in the data set for the noose. This is a 20 something, 25 year data set that we're looking at, is that we're getting both. We're getting acidification and basification, depending on uh uh, events that are uh, impacting the system and also whether or not there's eutrophication going on. But mm. in the noose, in the noose, in the, at least in the upper part of the noose, say the, the noose before it gets into Pamlico Sound, overall we're seeing actually basification because eutrophication is, you know, still going on. So we're, we're tying up more CO2 than is being released, except when you see these storm events, and then you're getting big releases. Um, and, and so there is quite a bit of noise in the pH, but overall, 
uh, we're not seeing really like classic ocean acidification that's going on in our estuaries. And mm. in more eutrophic estuaries, we're actually seeing, uh, you know, increases in pH, uh, particularly in the upper part of the system. But if you, but these storms can uh, cause, you know, dips in the, in the pH. I think this, this also points out that you really need to have long-term data sets to really be able to evaluate this trend over long periods. But mm. uh, bottom line answer is we're not really seeing the classic ocean acidification in our estuaries, mm. at least not in the, at least not in the news in Pamlico Sound. Okay, so maybe you talk about maybe something I maybe missed. How about the hypoxia? You know, the new in the news, yeah. that's the hypoxia. Sometimes the fish kill very yeah. very bad. So before and after hurricane. The hurricane will make the things worse or yeah. make the things a little bit easier because of physical mixing. Well, initially, you know, for example, in the news, initially, um, a, a, hur a very wet hurricane, you know, when it comes downstream, will actually mix the whole system and uh, do away with hypoxic bottom water. But it doesn't take long for the hypoxic bottom water to come back. Mm. Because as soon as you get salinity stratification in the system, which could be a matter of like a week or two, a week or two, then the hypoxic comes back. And what we noticed after Floyd is that the uh, even though initially there was full oxygenation up and down the water column, uh, afterwards, say a month or two afterwards, the hypoxia was actually worse. And that's wow. probably because not only because of the stratification, but because of all that organic matter uh, coming into the system, settling in the, uh, in the bottom water. And, uh, and I can tell you just from the data we collected after Floyd, uh, the Pamlico Sound had a very huge uh, hypoxic zone that lasted uh, quite a long time actually until the next storm came along, something like uh, a month or two or so. And that led to uh, fish kills and fish disease and, and, and uh, big impacts on shellfish, negative impacts on shellfish. So I think the answer is initially, yeah, it's good because it, you know, it's mixing everything up and oxygenating, but the good part doesn't last very long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very, very good, that's very good. So uh, anybody else? So I think almost 10, 20 and I think, Hans, thank you, thank you very much. I think your talk, your presentation really make our source to think talk webinar series much rich, much broad right. impact. That's right. well, I want to I want to thank everybody for putting up with the uh, with <laughs> with the uh, problems we we're having here. I think we're we've yeah. been having some power problems here <laughs> with uh, with the storm, so we probably got interrupted there. No problem. So uh, I guess it's because you sent me a link of your talk, so it's okay. I share your presentation with oh, the yeah. community, right? Yeah, no problem. And and anyone, if they're still on the call, if just send me an email, and I'll be more than glad to send you some papers that really uh, take off on what I talked about. Okay. That's, Can you that's give your right. email address? Oh, uh, it's h pearl h p a e r l at email one word dot unc dot edu so Hans, if you put in your first slide there's an email there okay if, can you move to your first slide your, your PPT? uh have to go back let's just, see. just it. that's the problem when you have so too many slides see <laughs> <laughs> oh no that's my website but oh. that's okay oh. okay that's it's fine. on my website too Okay, okay. I think it's some somewhere I have somewhere, uh, but uh, I, anyway. think, uh, I think if yeah. you just Google H Pearl, yeah. you, uh, <laughs> you'll get it. And uh, remember the A comes before the E. Yeah. Ross, I can send to you, if you yeah, I, I, I send you okay. okay, cool. Thank you, thank you again for, you know, uh, for all the audience. So I uh, hope I'll see you sometime next week. Okay. So, great, okay. Uh all right, everybody, stay All healthy, right. stay out of trouble. Thanks, Hans. Bye.